Good evening, everybody. My name is Vishal Gondal, and I'm the founder and CEO of Goki. I like to once again welcome you to our weekly series where we talk to experts on healthcare and everything happening around the world of health, especially when we are in the biggest wave, the wave two of coronavirus, which has hit India badly. Uh, there are millions of people infected. We know what's happening across the country. Luckily, cities like Mumbai and Delhi seem to have some control over it. But we can see how the virus is causing havoc now across smaller cities and towns of India. And it has even reached the villages. With all of this, the people in the front line are our doctors, our nurses and healthcare professionals. And it is their response and their first approach towards this disease, which has helped us control it to some extent. And now to talk about this on the role of the doctors in this community, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lance Pinto. Dr. Pinto is a very senior pulmonologist uh, who's consulting with Hinduja Hospital in Mumbai and he's also associated with number of other healthcare institutions, both in India and abroad. He has studied uh, his medicine in India and done uh, his epidemiology in Canada. And he's one of the most well-respected voices when it comes to treatment, management, and even looking at how this virus is behaving uh, as far as India is concerned. He's also been very vocal about how the treatment protocols and how the medical community is talking about treating the virus. Uh, in fact, uh, I had a personal experience. My wife, who was uh, positive, went through uh, Dr. Pinto's uh, treatment protocol, and you know we were happy with the outcome. She's negative. And uh, Dr. Pinto has been extensively covered in CNN, BBC, and various publications, both in India and abroad. With that, I'd love to welcome Dr. Pinto uh, on the show with Goki. Welcome. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you for that generous introduction. And thank you for all the work which I know you, your wife and your family do in the background to help people uh, su suffering from COVID, people needing all sorts of uh, help in COVID. I, I know you've been doing a lot and thank you for that as well. No, I think, you know, this is truly a, a scenario where we as society members have come forward. You know, of course, we are not doctors, uh, but with whatever limited capacity we had and citizens across the country, they all have gone beyond their call of duty and help. But specifically, the medical community is hailed as the true heroes in this. So I wanted to start by asking you that what is the thought process in your minds that today you are seeing so many cases in front of your eyes and so many deaths, I presume while doctors have been warning about this, how does it feel uh, looking at the current scenario from a medical or a doctor's perspective? A lot has changed over the past year. I think we started off with a lot of uncertainty. So there was a lot of fear. Uh, a lot of us felt like we were walking completely into uncharted territories. We would, um, treatment protocols hadn't been established. Everybody was trying different things at that point of time. You were going with your gut feeling. Uh, you know, things like hazmats were new to us, things like N95s, wearing them all the time was new. Uh, and, I, and I think all of us went through a phase where there was a lot of fear among us as well. You know, we had to go back to our families at the end of the day. Uh, and there was concern about whether, you know, we were keeping our families safe, whether we should do anything related to that. Over the year, I think over the past year, our confidence in treating the disease has increased significantly. Um, if you've... Uh, kept abreast of the literature, we know we have a reasonably good idea of what works and what doesn't work and what might work and therefore should be investigated. Uh, and I, I think that's that's led to a lot of uh, scientific, rational, calm treatment uh, among those who've, uh, who've kept themselves abreast of the literature. So I think even the way we talk to patients right now, I think I have, lot of, I have a lot more confidence when I speak to patients about uh, what their trajectory is likely to be, what are the things that they need to watch out for, what are the red flags, et cetera. Um, but, you know, that's that's one aspect. As doctors have been one aspect. Of course, there are nurses who've had to spend prolonged duties within wards. 
wearing hazmats i think i think a lot of respect goes out to them because they've had to bear the real brunt and and the fact that it hasn't eased over the past year hasn't really helped you know i think it's it's been uh, it's been very frustrating hoping that things will get better and you know we'll be able to shut down our wards we'll be able to go back to the earlier way of life and not seeing that has been has been a little frustrating and disappointing uh, and you know again suddenly you know we saw uh, dr kk agarwal just passed away and so many doctors have you know uh, not been able to make it because of covid and and there is this big question mark right that how can this happen because uh, we believe that doctors have already gone through their vaccinations and so has all the medical staff so would you like to give us some context because there is always this hesitation or fear now that oh is this new virus or the new variant as we call it is it not are the vaccines not as effective against it so what are your thoughts or any comments around this whole myth no that's a fantastic question and i i think you know the answer to fears and the answer to assurances all should come from data you know at the end of the day so if you look at covid shield for example for which we have the maximum amount of data from across the world if you look at the trials for covid shield about the efficacy is somewhere between 60 to 70 75% in most trials across the world now what does efficacy mean it means that if you take 100 people who have not received the vaccine you take 100 people who have received two doses of the vaccine for every 100 people who get the disease or who get infected without taking the vaccine around 30 to 40 individuals who have received both the doses of the vaccine will get infected so that's not a trivial number that's not a small number so 40 out of 100 people for 100 people infected without the vaccine right so we are all of us are going to listen more and more all over the place about people who received both the doses and have got infected that's not a that's not such a rare event now what is believed across the world universally for every vaccine which has been reported so far is that after the two doses of the vaccine if you do get the disease it tends to be a milder form you should not ideally die so if you look at uh, the mrna vaccines in the us it's a one in a million chance of death if you've received the vaccine and it's about a five in a million chance of getting hospitalized if you've received the vaccine what would be great is if we had that kind of context in india if you know we have a whole database of all healthcare workers who have got vaccinated now india by virtue of being such a humongous country look at our population right even small exceptional situations where unfortunately doctors die for example uh, could stand out as being really really you know odd whereas if you have the data if you look at it statistically maybe it's not beyond chance what if it is still you know actually one in a million or one in a very small number no, and, and i, I think that yeah, and i, I think that that needs from, to come from the data right and i saw a tweet from the ceo of uh... apollo hospital who mentioned that apollo has pretty much got their entire staff vaccinated they have not reported thank god a single death so from that context do you have any more data like like i know in hinduja i, I presume everybody is is vaccinated and what right, is so, so so we've not had a single death we've not had a single death post vaccination from what i know people have got reinfected so we we we've heard of people getting reinfected but again most of them have had a very mild course you know which is what is anticipated and expected however there will be you know it's there is no zero in medicine there's no zero in probability right there will be individuals who very unfortunately will pass away after receiving both the doses the question always is what is the denominator you know of how many people is that one individual standing up also you know this is for the first time where the public in general have got so involved in the world of medicine you know i now see every day and you know i'm sure you are getting the same whatsapp forwards as we are of armchair epidemiologists and you know people who are stock brokers giving you know their tips on what works and what doesn't work and the problem is that there is so much noise and the word noise is because there is information but you can't make sense out of this information so where do you look at for patterns in this noise so again you know i think this is a this is a great moment in time in some ways you know i have always been a proponent of people asking me questions uh why should anybody have any medicine put in their body unless they know why it's going into their body so i you know even the way i conduct my clinic i mean there's complete transparency nobody is ever going to even get you know yelled at or whatever for asking a question because it's absolutely your right now uh therefore you know this this whole interest in healthcare which uh, covid has brought about can be a very positive thing can be a very 
uh, can be a turning point in which a dialogue starts opening up between healthcare practitioners and their patients. So, okay, fine, you've given me remdesivir. Why have you given me remdesivir? Or you've given me steroids. You know, why have you not given me steroids or given me steroids? I think these are all good questions to ask. Now, to answer your question, you know, most countries have an international set of guidelines, which is which which they call living guidelines, which means that they are updated on a regular basis. If you look at the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, it has this wonderful round circular flow chart, which they have, you know, it's, it's there online, where they, where they clearly mention drugs, which so far have no role, have been clearly proven not to work. Drugs which have you know clearly proven to work, and drugs which may have a role and are undergoing trials right now. So simple websites like that, I think, are a great uh, great resource because you know number one, the British Medical Journal, for example, has a certain level of trust associated with it. We know that there will be world experts who will put out that information. It will not be a WhatsApp forward. It will not be a based on you know my gut feeling says this works or I believe this works. It will be based on solid research conducted. Um, so I. I think that should be a starting point for data. So if you really want information, look at the CDC, for example. Nobody has got everything consistently right in COVID. Everybody, it's, it's, a, it's a work in progress, you know, but at least the strong signals are generally out there. So you ask anybody who knows their data, do steroids save lives in COVID? The answer will be an emphatic yes when used at the right time. You ask any expert, does remdesivir save lives? The answer would be an emphatic no, it does not save lives. So there are some absolutes where we have a reasonable amount of data. It's just that you need to know, have a, have a good website, which you hold on to, um, which you refer to, you know, and, and there are guidelines which are, which are easily available. You no, know, I remember when the pandemic started, the first drug was hydroxychloroquine and everybody, and, you know, we know it started by President Donald Trump talking about it and then India sent millions of these doses everywhere. And I remember that everybody was trying to hold this hydroxychloroquine. And now nobody even talks about this drug. So clearly there was a general acceptance between everybody that this doesn't work. But at the same time, we are still hearing about, you know, black marketing of remdesivir, people standing in lines for hours. Every day there are tweets, uh, there are WhatsApp messages of people trying to hunt for uh, remdesivir and plasma and uh, I'm sorry I can't even take half the names of these uh, medicines uh, at least the good tip to medicine companies is that they can now make the names a little easier now that consumers are going to start <laughs> taking it so right. why is that happening why are the medical community because finally this has to be administered by a doctor or a hospital so why is this uh, information not getting percolated everywhere why are people still recommending this I think some of it is coming from a sense of desperation and I empathize with that. Let's not be judgmental. When you have a loved one on a ventilator, you're not going to chase science as much as you're going to clutch at straws. You're going to, you're going to say, you know, okay, take a 1% chance. I will take that 1% chance. I think some of that is coming from the desperation. Uh, that being said, unfortunately, India is also a country where a lot of things can be purchased over the counter or you can pressurize your doctor. The guidelines are not that very clear. You know, I mean, why should... In an ideal world, why should the person who is vulnerable, you know, there's a huge conflict of interest when you have somebody on a ventilator. Why should the burden be on that person to make the decision of whether this is scientific or not? There should be clear guidelines which are out there. There should be clear regulations in place to prevent the sale. And I think I think the system will then take care of itself. You know, when, when you can't buy, for example, one of the best cough syrups for cough in general in respiratory medicine is codeine. Right, but it's it's practically impossible to get codeine that easily because it's so heavily regulated, and maybe rightly so. Maybe it should be regulated. So there are mechanisms in place to regulate things. I think we just need to be a little more affirmative, uh, both ways. I mean, you can't expect it to come from from patients and relatives. Maybe you can't expect it to come from the doctor who's in that situation where he's actually being pressurized to do everything under the sun. I think there needs to be a bigger picture that'll that'll regulate all of this. And I think what is kind of really surprising for a lot of us is that we can't find these medicines in hospitals or with doctors or in dispensaries or pharma uh, in uh, medical shops. But somehow uh, we have our heroes like Sonu Sood or uh, Srinivas Rao or you know Vikas or whoever, right? Somehow these people, the rest of the people seem to get hold of these medicines. 
so do you also feel that right now there is some kind of scarcity created or people holding this what is happening i mean what what sense can you make out of this scenario i agree with you you know it's there's no transparency to the best of my knowledge around this you know uh, so i i you know some parts of the country seem underserved some parts of the country seem to have a little bit of a surplus some parts you know through hospitals it seems to be relatively easier to get because i guess supply channels are in place the bigger hospitals probably don't have so much of a challenge a smaller nursing home seems to have a bigger challenge and is just writing the prescription and telling uh, the patient to you know fend for himself or herself uh again i think it all boils down to you know the supply chains and regulation that need to be in place which makes everything absolutely transparent if these many vials were produced these many were distributed this is where it is you know um no i agree with you there there, there clearly is uh, is non transparency around some of these issues given that you know a lot of people listening to this may be interested in knowing what is not just yours but what is a worldwide accepted course for treating corona covid is there a course which is or at least let's say that you know mostly most most of the top doctors agree on this protocol it's see for 85% of people you know who won't drop their oxygen levels who will stay at home it's very very straightforward you know in the first week generally all you need is paracetamol you need something stronger than paracetamol if the fever doesn't settle with paracetamol there may be some role of inhaler inhalers you know inhaled steroids especially if you have a cough if you're high risk uh, there is some there are a couple of studies which have recently been done which said says which suggest that if you're put on an inhaled steroid maybe the progression is slowed down maybe you won't progress uh, if you started on early uh, apart from that it's what would, what you would do for any cold you know take a decongestant if your nose is blocked uh, if you're having body ache you can use the same paracetamol uh, some people get diarrhea so use some sort of a probiotic if that's happening use some sort of a cough suppressant if the cough is irritating everything is driven by symptoms so in terms of pathology like what can we do to change the course of the disease there isn't really much unfortunately now if towards the end of the first week generally you know if if you're in that small 15% of people 15% or so of people who drop their oxygen levels that's where steroids you know really make a difference and that's the that's the only place where one should give steroids if your oxygen levels drop steroids should not be used just to bring down the fever um, or just to give a person a sense of well being if they having body ache etc that's not the right place to use steroids if your oxygen levels drop that is the right place to start systemic steroids so that's their consensus is consensus is around oxygen if your oxygen levels are are lower than 92% or so you definitely need oxygen so nobody is going to say you know let a person be so there's clear so there's clear consensus on the use of steroids at the right time there's clear consensus on the use of oxygen there's clear consensus there's more or less clear consensus across the world that you should not be trying anything in the first week so this whole laundry list of drugs that we seem to be using left right and center are pretty much seen used only in india you know one of the big questions you should ask you or people need to ask is why are these drugs if these drugs are really effective why is india the only country using this whole list of drugs right why is it not accepted international standards to use these drugs yeah, that's now exactly- one it doesn't seem that remdesivir or tox toxlizumab or ivermectin and all these drugs are even part of international protocol i don't know if they're not they clearly not so we we we've come up with this simple infographic which is available on india covid sos.org so it's a bunch of us from canada us and you know we've collaborated and we've come up with this infographic which clearly explains what are the things that works and what we we've, we've actually put a section there which says what are the things that don't work now something like remdesivir you know will not save lives you know that is clear but it may have a role so supposing somebody is high risk for example is having a high fever gets admitted because they are unwell has borderline oxygen levels if they are admitted soon enough it may have a role in shortening the duration of treatment so so there's a little nuance there maybe let's not completely throw remdesivir out uh maybe again you know that's that's not proven beyond a doubt something like tocilizumab has a role you know but but in a very specific circumstance it's not to be used left right and center uh there are some experimental therapies that are being constantly looked at and you know as the, we don't have the evidence yet but that's pretty much where we stand in terms of the evidence right now we, so, and, you know and nothing I have nothing else really works experimentation right if it's a new therapy let's do it but when it is proved it doesn't work let's stop doing it doing it right like plasma i know that icmr has also finally come and said plasma is not working 
but still every day there are people donating plasma and this whole thing around because people are putting themselves at risk when they go and actually to donate blood they are entering into a healthcare facility so how can we stop people doing this i think the, the you know what what happened yesterday was a great step forward that they revised their guidelines and said that plasma need yesterday before yesterday they said plasma needs to be out you know and this is happening close to i think close to 10 months after india produced the one big trial that india did was the placid trial which was related to plasma which showed that it didn't work after that there have been a bunch of trials which have all consistently said that plasma does not work for covid-19 so i i think this uh, this guideline the statement coming out has come quite late you know honestly most of us were pushing for it uh, quite some time back saying you know plasma really needs uh, needs to be out of the guidelines but all said and done that's a step forward that's that's a great step and hopefully you know this will be the start of multiple such steps where unproven therapies are taken out of guidelines and we are all rooting for it we are all pushing hard for it we all hope that this is the first step uh, how can it be countered i i think uh, you know all celebrities need to get on board a lot of plasma is being driven by celebrities who clearly mean good i mean they are obviously not doing it you know because they want to do any harm to anyone uh, it comes from a good place it comes from a place of you know blood donations i guess you know there's a positivity associated with that that a person who's been through it has recovered is now helping someone else recover so the framework is 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 very good but unfortunately if it doesn't work it doesn't work right i mean look at the number of kits that are going to be used to collect that plasma look at the man hours of people individuals your lab technicians who are going to be collecting plasma what about them all of those resources could be diverted to something that really helps instead so so just to kind of summarize what you are saying is for 85% you just need regular cold cough you know medication only if in week 1 things don't look good is when you need some serious prescription medication like you know whether it is uh, steroids or uh, any other kind of uh, drugs of course you don't need remdesivir etc uh, and you maybe right. need supplemental oxygen and then maybe eight thought at what cut what is the point when somebody should look at whether they need hospitalization because right now the impression i am getting is people get positive and they are immediately trying to buy all these medicines and immediately trying to go into a hospital they it's gone to the other extreme that because they think i will not get a hospital bed when i need it people are going and trying to occupy the bed in advance so that that's a very unfortunate uh, situation and again you know we empathize with it you know everyone it's a it's a disease that has caused so much of paranoia out of proportion to what it should uh, given the fact that again you know 85% of people are going to get better by themselves but that paranoia number one there is paranoia you know all of us have heard of somebody we know somebody we love pa- having passed away from the disease so that uh, that already plants a seed uh it's not something that happens to somebody else right it's, it's all of us have seen it up close in front so that paranoia plus this fear that you know if i go down that road will i get a bed is is leading to a lot of panic now i i think the way to counter panic is again with statistics with knowledge with numbers telling you that most people you know if you leave them alone all over the world most people will get better and and, and i think you know we really need to hold on to that statistic uh the other thing which you rightly pointed out is most people get really panicky on the day they see their swab and 9999 out of uh, 10000 times the day you get your swab is not the day anything bad is going to happen you know you have a good 4 to 5 days after that to sort out your life in terms of you know getting a getting a good pulse oximeter and monitoring regularly getting making sure you have a thermometer putting yourself in isolation making sure you're hydrated you sleep well um you know having a doctor on board if you feel you need to have a doctor on board i mean you can one can even argue that you don't necessarily need a doctor on board even at that stage but you know you have you have a good window in which you can sort out things in a calm collected reasonable way rather than panicking so i i think that's that's a strong message that needs to go out that the day you get your swab you start planning in terms of what you want to do over the next week or so what are the things you have to monitor now this cut off that you mentioned there there's no cut off in terms of a day you know some young people for example because you have a strong immune response you can have a fever sometimes for 2 3 weeks but you don't drop your oxygen levels it's just fever 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 it's like a nuisance fever but the oxygen levels don't budge and that fever in principle is not going to cause a problem you know honestly uh but everybody gets jittery you know everybody at some point says enough is enough something needs to be done uh but if you do want to give steroids for that fever etc you know you need to give it a good 8 to 10 days of safety where you know that the virus is kind of left the body 
and everything that is being faced at that point is an immune response and now clearly there is talks of how excessive and misuse of steroid is also leading to the black fungus and you know please talk a little bit about because it's only seems to be unique to india you know this has not been seen in us or uh, it's not something which we have heard of in any other major countries right right so the first thing again that you know the context is very important again because the amount of news bites it seems to be getting is completely out of proportion to the number of cases right it, all over the country whatever is being counted is still being counted in terms of under 500 or, or under 100 or even less than that right now in an ideal world you should see probably you know 1/10th of what you're seeing right now i agree you know it's way more than what you normally should see but even way more is still a very small tiny fraction which is something that people need to reassure themselves with so i have had people come into my clinic in the past week with a mild headache who not even received steroids or not even like don't even have diabetes or any risk factors but because they have a mild headache they are like could it be black fungus and we do not want that kind of paranoia that kind of paranoia doesn't help anybody right i think the pun intended to this black cloud the silver lining is it at least this will lead to some reduction of steroid uses right because now people no absolutely I, I absolutely just... so i'm not right right no so i'm not trivializing those number of cases which have happened those number of cases which have happened probably a significant proportion of them should not have happened so of course it should lead to a change in prescribing practices it should lead us to think about you know are we doing the right thing when it comes to steroids uh, but you know to put things in context like you said the us and the uk if you see the trial which used the largest trial which used steroids it was used in 6 mg for 10 days of dexa that was what was used up to 10 days us maybe they didn't say like everybody gets 10 days they say if a person is fantastic on day 7 stop it on day 7 you don't need to give it for 10 days that's how careful people are when they use steroids you know uh, in contrast to that you know we've seen a lot of people receiving steroids for a month month and a half you know people think that they need to taper it over a long long time uh, and that adds to the risk you know so the duration and the dose and of course the background illnesses so duration you know if you give it for months or a month or so you're adding to the risk the dose if you're doubling the dose so 6 mg again to put things in perspective because again all of us know the names of steroids these days 6 mg of dexa is about 32 mg of methylprednisolone which is known as medrol or predmet or those other names which is about 40 mg of prednisolone the brand names are like bisolone omnipotent so it's 40 mg what we often see is like 40 mg three times a day or you know 32 mg four times a day those are excessively high doses yeah, and and right you're overdoing the dose you're overdoing the duration sometimes and you have to look at the patient profile so if it's somebody who's diabetic you need to be a lot more cautious if somebody has kidney disease somebody has liver disease chronic liver disease somebody has an underlying malignancy which is already immunosuppressive you need to be a lot more careful in those circumstances but by and large you know i mean good that it's going to lead to a discussion around steroid use but people should not be as paranoid as they seem to be right now so to simply put the role of a steroid is to just subdued the immune system so that the immune system is not attacking our own body is that what the role of a steroid is essentially so role of a role of a steroid is is uh, subduing an immune system that has gone into hyperdrive that for some reason is uh, is causing a bigger problem than the problem itself right so the immune system is is in in all its enthusiasm trying to go and fix a problem which is the virus but sometimes the virus starts dying maybe there's dead virus fragments around which the immune system does not recognize as dead and it mounts an even stronger 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 response and at some point you want to tell the immune system listen this is this is this is counterproductive this is this is not really helping uh, and that's where you use steroids to suppress the immune system got it and when you are doing it this is what sprungs other infections because while it is trying to deal with covid the other viruses or fungus or bacteria living around uh, suddenly are like wow you know the immune system is no longer fighting so it's my turn to come out and that's what is kind of triggering all these parallel other infections absolutely so the black fungus you and i are breathing it right now as we speak this fungus these fungal spores are in the air around us you know you put a slice of bread outside the fungus that grows is the same thing we are talking about so we are breathing it on a daily basis is just that an intact immune system is good enough to fight any of it the moment you suppress that for a long period of time you become vulnerable to it to to it becoming invasive and and we always talk about this right and that that the human body and immune system is designed to fight all these things this is just that it's a new being it is not trained for it 
So vaccination is training you in a way to fight this. So it's like, you know, you are doing a lot of uh, uh, training before the war, as it is said, right? And when, it, when in COVID, you are directly going to war without knowing the enemy, which is why the, there's a lot more damage in a way. And vaccination kind of, you know, trains your immune system to do it. Absolutely. And again, you don't need to, like, I mean, hypothetically, just in terms of like structure, it's a wonderful argument, but we don't even need that anymore, right? The data is in front of us. Look at the United Kingdom, look at Israel, yeah. look at even the US now, you know, countries which have gone hardcore on vaccination are turning the curve. The number, the number of deaths are almost like next to zero nowadays in, in, in these countries. So we don't even need to go into an argument structure. We have evidence, right? Staring at us in the face. Also, uh, you know, I, I just reading this very important question why i was just messaged this about from a parent uh, suddenly there is this big talk of kids 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 and this virus is going to infect as if this virus knows that oh who is my host you know first of all is there a difference between you know kid or adult or male or female is the virus behaving differently and if so why are kids especially more going to be at higher risk why is this impression there right now no, in fact, it's just the opposite. Kids seem to, by and large, do extremely well. So if you talk about kids, for most kids, it's one or two days of fever, a little bit of a runny nose, sore throat, and they just move on in life. You know, I mean, and this is a this is the experience the world over. Of course, there are some cases of something which is called MISC, which happens a month, month and a half after COVID. But again, we're talking about extremely rare events. Now, the problem is when the whole universe is infected in extremely rare proportion also converts into significant numbers. So we have, we have to watch for that. We want to prevent those small numbers as well as we can. And maybe, you know, vaccination will have a role in that. Uh, but kids universally have done extremely well, which is why there's a lot of people, including me at some point of time, were pushing for kids, for schools to be opened, you know, because you're depriving kids of uh, their social interactions when the actual harm caused to them is really, really, really low. The only, the only counter argument to that is kids are going to come back home with the virus where grandpa, grandma, mom are there, you know, they can infect other people, etc. Now, this whole hypothesis that the third wave is going to infect children, I don't believe that there's much of a science to it. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, but you are the expert, the hype, all the epidemiologists and all the other no, people talking about this no, are politicians and journalists. No, in the sense that, I mean, I don't, I, so I think the logic people are using is, you know, first time around, a lot of old people died. Second time around, a lot of middle-aged people died. So third time around, it has to be children. I don't think there is any structural logic to that, especially because we don't know what the zero prevalence in children is. What if we, you know, did a study looking at all the children in the city, for example, and realized that most of them already have antibodies? Which is highly possible, given the fact that they tend to have a milder infection, given the fact that, you know, kids fall sick often for one or two days and nobody even blinks an eye at that time. Who's been testing them that religiously, right? So what if we did a zero prevalence study and realized that most kids are already infected? Then, you know, they're going to be completely yeah, immune from the next wave. Adults are also, co uh, you know, living with the kids. So, I mean, it's logical if 60% adults are having antibodies. Uh, in fact, I was just seeing a tweet today uh, by Dr. Velumani. As per Thyroca data, 60% uh, antibody presence already. Uh, that is right. the data they released. So if 60% right. are there, why is the kids' population not going to be 60%? Exactly. So I think this is a lot of speculation. And I mean, it's good to, it's good to be fearful and therefore take measures to prevent the next wave. Again, you know, one of those things about... Uh, paranoia, advertising or whatever, if it leads to good behaviors, if it leads, you know, if children... If wanting to protect your children leads us to be more serious about masking and distancing and vaccination, etc., it's great. But I don't think this is rooted in science where you say that the next wave is 100% going to affect children. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that's true. And, and when it comes to, you know, the mutations of the virus, right? Now, suddenly we are talking about some Amravati version of the mutation of the virus or, you know, you know virus is going to keep mutating. But there right. is this belief that at some point of time, this virus can, you know, be, the vaccines won't be effect, effective. So right. is that scientifically possible or is there, you know, any kind of uh, scientific evidence around? Because, because I understand the way the vaccines work is that they are going to try and attack the, the spikes. But if the spikes itself are not spikes, then the virus itself can't attach to you. So how will this whole thing work? So the jury is out on this one, you know, nobody's clear, nobody's absolutely certain. For example, there are certain variants 
which in a laboratory, if you use antibodies, you need a higher concentration of antibodies to neutralize the, the variant versus another variant where a lower concentration of antibodies uh, suffices. So we clearly know that there is a difference in terms of how well uh, our antibodies are going to be able to neutralize certain variants. And there's, you know, these are called escape mutations. So the virus, I mean, honestly, if you think about it, the virus also lives on the same earth that we do, right? So the virus is also trying to, uh, not, not, not in a thoughtful way, but by random chance, it keeps mutating and whatever works best in terms of propagation, whatever works best in terms of transmissibility gets selected. That's, that's the process of natural selection. So uh, there are going to be some, so the more uh, time progresses, there are going to be some variants which may potentially have the ability to escape the current by, uh, the vaccines, which is why, you know, people are looking at different strategies that you, you know, it's called a prime boost strategy. You give one sort of vaccine as the first dose, you give another sort of vaccine as the second dose. So you, you target two different parts of the viral uh, protein. Uh, I mean, we will have to evolve as, as the science goes by. But as of today, it doesn't look like um, any of the current viral variants uh, have a major escape mechanism from the vaccines that are being given as of today. And also, you know, I remember in the US, uh, you know, wherever we used to travel, there was the annual vaccine. There was this flu shot you took every year and they used to keep updating the, the variants. Do you see this taking a form where you may have to actually go in for some kind of an annual vaccination? Absolutely. So that's what people are speculating. Uh, how, what should be the time duration between the booster, so-called booster dose and these two doses uh, is we, we're not really sure. So there are people in labs looking at serial antibody levels, looking at cell-mediated immunity over time, looking at whether those levels wane, how do they wane, what, what is the, the ideal strategy to boost it. Uh, so yes, I mean, this, this might be a strategy eventually that once a year or once every eight, 10 months or so, you will need to take a, a booster vaccine. Uh, but that's something we don't know yet. You know, time is going to tell us that. So, you know, if I have to ask you a question where you have to gaze in the future, you know, given what has happened with the pandemic, you know, let's assume it will take another year, two years for this to settle down. What do you see as a change in the healthcare system or the change in patient behavior, which you think will become a lot more prevalent in at least India? I hope that, you know, masking becomes more common from a perspective of at least individuals who are sick, you know. So if I am sick, I have a runny nose, I have a cold, I wear a mask, which is what the, a lot of Asian countries, you know, have integrated that after SARS initially, maybe, maybe even before that, it was embedded into almost their DNA that if you are unwell, you wear a mask because you don't want to transmit it to others. Just a small step like that. If we get something like that out of this pandemic, it'll, it has tremendous potential. It has potential from a perspective of tuberculosis. Uh, if you look at the graphs of influenza this year in the US, the graphs have completely flattened out. There's hardly any influenza uh, anywhere in the world as compared to the seasonal peaks that, that were happening prior. So if we manage to, you know, get this sim simple measures, no spitting, for example, no, you know, wearing a mask when you're unwell, trying to keep crowds to as sensible as possible, you know, it may not be always possible in India, but you know, if we can do that, uh, I, I think that will be a big step forward from a health perspective. That's from a individual behavior perspective, but of course, from the healthcare system, I, I hope this is an eye opener for us to realize uh, that it's 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 supremely challenging to scale up in the middle of a problem. You have to kind of be prepared in advance. Your scaling up has to happen before the problem hits you. And, and I hope this is an eye opener for a lot of us. So you used to always say that in India, the doctor patient ratio, the per population, the bed ratios are extremely low. And this pandemic has completely exposed that system, right? That what can, what does that low actually mean is what we have now realized that when people have crores of rupees in their pockets, they can't get a hospital bed or you are having nobody, you have nothing and you can't get a hospital bed, right? So it has kind of become a leveler because finally the, the system needs to gear up. You know, today it's unfortunate that you can order using Zomato or Swiggy, anything on a press of a button, it will come, but you can't get oxygen, which is the lifeline of the country. You know, the most essential things are, are scares and being uh, black marketed and junk food is available on demand. You know, you can order pizza right. in 30 minutes. So I think partly I, and you know, since Goki's vision is about preventive healthcare, one of the things which we are talking about is the whole 
people's own comorbidities, right? If people don't invest in their own health, if you have diabetes, blood pressure, hypertension, and all these, you are a sitting duck for all these viruses and infections. And that is what has happened. So do you really see a role of nutrition, fitness, and preventive health care in the future? I again, you know, it's it's a fantastic thought, and I hope I hope we realize this more and more. And it's it's not just prevent. It's it's and these these problems tend to be uh, multi-sectorial, right? It's not one thing. For example, sidewalks on the road, right? Let's start thinking in terms of okay, you know, we've managed to work from home. Is there a way where we can decongest roads further so we can create sidewalks everywhere? Let people start walking everywhere. It's it's extremely challenging to walk sometimes. so even small behaviors like that small cues like that you know make you know make people use cars less of, often in some way you know uh, a lot of these behaviors preventive behaviors are not necessarily the solutions are not always in health alone the solutions could be in city planning the solutions could be in different aspects where you encourage people to live live healthy and i i do hope i do hope this is an eye opener to realize that uh, exactly what you said you're a sitting duck if you are vulnerable and you know maybe one of the ways to one of the great ways to invest in healthcare is not just think about building hospitals and having more number of doctors it's to prevent people needing hospitals and, and needing doctors so i completely agree with you in fact you know i i know that uh, you know investing in your own health is somehow not considered important i think the pandemic at least is going to turn out to be a big wake up call i think before i end i also want to touch upon one thing which is trust uh we did a survey about 2 3 years back where 94% people said they don't trust hospitals doctors and healthcare system but today if you do the same survey i would i'm sure that number has gone higher and somehow because of the data or conflicting results and all of this somewhere the trust in the healthcare system has further de- depleted in to some extent so even though the healthcare you know the doctors have done so much so where do you think is this gap and how can the trust deficit between the medical community as well as you know the patients and everybody around can be built and what role can we play as citizens to do that i think it's very important uh, to have some sort of a trustworthy body which you know does things like guidelines does things like clear simple instructions for both the public who wants to read wants to dig deeper have resources which are available uh, and at the same time have individuals like america has a has a fauci right i mean fauci says something and there is there is a lot of value to what he says uh, i'm not saying that we necessarily don't have that kind of a system in place there's a system in place maybe it needs to be refined maybe it needs to be made a lot more credible such that you know we have a system as well so the U- the uk has something called nice guidelines it's the center of clinical excellence so if a nice guideline comes out most doctors will trust it blindly because there's a very rigorous process that goes into place uh, for that guideline to come out i think it would be great if we could manage to create some sort sort of a trust system where you know if it says that if this particular organization has come out with these guidelines you know let's not argue let's not debate uh, the the unfortunate part is that there are so many doctor voices out there you know everyone has a slightly different opinion sometimes there is no consensus and and that leads to a depletion of trust now i hear this very often if doctors themselves cannot agree about it then you know how can we how are we expected to trust doctors and i agree the messaging needs to be a lot more clear you know it needs to be made clear what works what doesn't work and we need to constantly update this you know everything has to be living what worked one year ago may not work today just because some large studies have been done in between and and that's fine you know it's not like the doctors are trying to cheat individuals the nature of science is that it keeps updating with time uh, and that's fine as long as you know that that is communicated in an efficient way no i think i think you made an excellent point and i just think that you know just the way we have an army and an air force and a navy to fight enemies which are visible it is time that our country and not just our country the world wakes up to these invisible enemy and just like we have a military general for army and air force we need to have a general for health in india which is a non political position i think it is time like you said there is nobody accountable at least in the us we had fauci or some figure head who you can look to who is maybe not partisan who is not doing politics right now uh, while we have our supreme court we have election commission we have you know a lot of bodies are there for other parts of uh, 
the society uh, clearly i think healthcare needs its body as you just mentioned and needs a very strong representative face uh, so that we we all can trust one person today uh, you know we know that you know all our uh, baba ramdev is coming up with his kind of medication and then there is the other extremes of what people want to do with cow urine and uh, cow dung which is kind of really crazy so i think there is so, and i'm not saying that a lot of the alternative therapies do work i'm not saying they don't but they are getting trivialized by some of the more extreme therapies which have no uh, facts around it in any case yeah i mean exactly even for alternative medicine let's have a voice which is credible right i mean if there is a voice which is credible in our alternative medicine we are all open to trying things that work absolutely and i think on on that note i would like to once again thank you for uh, having this conversation with us it was really insightful and i'm hoping that people listening to this will be able to get some more clarity and they will understand what an amazing job you and the entire healthcare community are are doing in spite of all these challenges right i mean uh, and kudos to you and everybody out there and like i said you are the true soldiers of india who are helping us through this big crisis thank you once again thank you thank thank you vishal